Hi, this week we're going to be uh, talking about assessing resilience. So assessing resilience essentially involves three steps. Um, specified resilience, understanding uh, thresholds, general resilience, and transformability. Uh, you can think about specified resilience, general resilience, and transformability being associated with thresholds. So specified resilience, specifying distance to thresholds. Uh, general resilience <coughs> is a general res uh, ability to adapt uh, and transformability, the capacity to become a different system. We'll talk about each of these uh, in turn. So specified resilience is knowing assessing some part of the system to particular kinds of a disturbance and whether <clears throat> and whether that disturbance might push a system over a particular threshold so it involves identifying the threshold and identifying the distance to that threshold you can think about that in terms of a three by three matrix and you think about that across different domains, such as social, economic, biophysical, uh, as, well, as well as across different scales. <clears throat> so as an, as an individual landowner, you may be most concerned about what's happening at the scale of your farm. But in order to really assess the biophysical uh, question, am I going to have enough water? Um, or the economic question, am I going to have enough um, money to run my farm next year? It's also really important to think about those thresholds at the scale above. So what are the regional economic dynamics? What are the regional dynamics in the aquifer where I get my water? Uh, as well as what's happening at smaller scales uh, than your farm. The next two steps, so the, uh, the first step of st specified resilience is known thresholds. Uh, next, it's important to think about thresholds of potential concern. Um, so things that you may not know right now are thresholds, um, but what potential thresholds exist that could be concerning. TPCs. Uh, and then... The third step for specified resilience is developing a conceptual model. We can see here the example, uh, or an example, in a savanna, a sort of foothill savanna grassland in uh, California. If you've ever been to any of these grasslands in kind of the northern part of the Sierra foothills, they're really beautiful. Um, but they also can f f sort of flip regimes or, or be in alternate regimes relatively easy. So if you just think about this model, uh, the model on the right is, or, or the sort of box of the regime, the state on the right is, is the ideal state, uh, blue oak savanna, approximately 25 to 50% canopy cover. You can see how either A, there's restoration pathways to get a system back to that state, um, or there's tipping points and thresholds where uh, you hit a particular threshold uh, and the system goes into another state, either uh, annual grassland or kind of an undisturbed woodland condition. So a lot more trees or a lot more grass um, from that blue oak savanna ideal state. Then the, the fourth step is uh, analytical models. So you can think about uh, these conceptual models. So the example just given was a state and transition model. Think about these conceptual models uh, and that fourth step is turning them into something more computational uh, such as an agent-based model. So the three steps to assessing resilience 
or the three components. The first was specified resilience. The second, we start to think about general resilience. General resilience is the capacity of a system that allows it to absorb disturbance of all kinds, including novel, unforeseen ones, so that parts of the system maintain function. Uh, I think a few weeks ago we talked about this as the ability to maintain identity. This is that broad term of resilience that we've kind of been thinking about most of the semester. It's the ability to respond quickly and effectively, uh, having reserves and access to needed resources, and the ability to keep options open. There are some key principles. I think uh, a few weeks ago we were, we were referring to these as principles of, of resilience um, that include diversity, modularity, tightness of feedbacks, openness, and reserves. Just to go through a few of those again, uh, when we think about diversity, we can think about functional diversity. Uh, so the ability for different components to play the same function in an ecosystem or social system and response diversity. So how do different components, different species, different actors respond uh, to a shock or to a disturbance? You can think about openness, which is the ease with which people, ideas, and species can move into the system. So how open is the system to, to new things, to new ideas, to new species, uh, to just adapting to change. Another component of general resilience is reserves. So you can think about reserves being a natural habitat. So national parks are a great example. Do we have enough reserves of uh, sort of, of wild land to maintain um, connect species connectivity to maintain uh, uh, biological diversity uh, general, to maintain a, a sort of a general resilience to, to change and disturbance. And social reserves refer to social memory of, of landscapes or of processes, local e ecological knowledge or local knowledge of how those systems work. Re economic reserves, a great example would be levels of saving savings. Some other important variables or principles of general resilience here. Uh, the tightness of feedbacks. So when feedbacks are, are, are tight, we're getting a good signal in the system that things are changing for better or worse. When those feedbacks become weaker, uh, it reduces resilience because we're not seeing or understanding the change in the system um, as well. Uh, modularity, so really tightly connected, tight subcomponents uh, will rapidly transmit shocks through the system. Uh, when systems are a little bit more modular, uh, shocks or disturbance may only affect one part of that system, one module of that system, without spreading throughout. And finally, leadership, social networks, and trust. So the social capital, how do we think about and measure uh, the social capital pieces of leadership, um, trust, social networks, bonding and bridging capital, etc. Transformability or transformative capacity is the capacity to affect transformational change. This involves three steps, getting beyond the state of denial, so admitting um, that we've got a problem, uh, that our system is heading towards a regime shift or it's already occurred, um, <clears throat> and sort of admitting that, that that's the first step. Two is deciding or uncovering um, articulating what those options are and three is having the capacity to guide through transformation 
really good example of this that's currently ongoing is thinking about the, the coral bleaching that's occurring uh, really around the world, but in particular in the Great Barrier Reef. I think most managers and, and researchers in the Great Barrier Reef um, have gone beyond the state of denial. This is clearly happening. Uh, it's leading to a major regime shift in coral reefs uh, to identifying what those options are and literally making plans for uh, or assessing the capacity, uh, building the capacity for transformability. So knowing that these changes are occurring, putting together options, and then building that social, political, ecological capacity uh, to say, okay, here's where we want to be. We know what's happening. Here's where we want to be. Um, now let's guide the system through the transformation. And then kind of just returning to the first slide, the three steps of resilience assessment um, form an agreed upon mental model of how parts in the system are working and where thresholds might lie. So specified resilience. Um, reflect on your system's ability to cope and identify some attributes that may be limiting general resilience and consider systems capacity to transform if needed.